Hi, greetings. Welcome to a new episode of Art Matters with Wayne Quackenbush. And my name is Wayne Quackenbush, and I'm the president of the Portsmouth Arts Guild. I also have a place in Newport, Rhode Island, where I show local artists. Uh, we'll be talking to a couple of artists today. We'll have Suzanne Lewis, who is the vice president of the Guild, and we'll have uh, artist and musician and singer, uh, Sue DeSalt Eddins. And I just wanted to say that the Portsmouth Arts Guild has a gallery on East Main Road, 2679 East Main Road in uh, Portsmouth. And we have hours there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. We show lots of different art, uh, usually a different show every month. And I'd like to introduce our first guest today, uh, artist, uh, vice president, uh, printmaker, teacher, Suzanne Lewis. And Suzanne, I've known you for a number of years. Uh, in fact, you're the person that introduced me to the Guild. Um, but during all that time, I never knew how you became involved with the Guild. So would you like to tell us that story? Sure. Um, about seven years ago, I had uh, contacted the Guild to teach a printmaking workshop. And um, they said, sure. And I, I taught the workshop, and I really enjoyed it. So I asked them I, um, if I could continue with other workshops. And the person who was coordinating the classes at the time said, well, unfortunately, I'm stepping down as the education coordinator uh, that runs the classes or organizes the classes. And nobody has come to take my place. So it looks like that uh, we're not going to be able to continue offering classes. So I was disappointed, and I went home and thought about it. And um, the next day, I, I got in touch with her, and I said, um, I'm willing to volunteer to, to do that if you'd like me to. So that I met with her and the uh, president of the Guild at the time, and they told me what it involved. And I jumped in, and I've enjoyed it very much ever since. I've met a lot of very interesting people, and I just really enjoy uh, giving people the opportunity to take art classes and l learn, uh, develop their skills or learn new skills. So it's very satisfying to me. So you've been the arts uh, coordinator for a while now. Uh, you want to give us an idea what kind of classes the Guild offers? Sure. Uh, we try to have a, a variety of different classes, um, different media. We have watercolor workshops, uh, oil painting, we're, we're starting with pastels now as well. Um, and we also try to have a variety of different levels so that people who have no art experience um, can take a workshop with us. For example, we have a Chinese calligraphy workshop coming up in November, which is open to everyone, no experience needed. Uh, people who, would, who are new to art um, but would like to to develop their artistic skills. We have a number of beginner classes. Um, usually we have a beginner watercolor class. Uh, this semester we're also having a beginner acrylic class. And then we also have uh, classes for uh, people that do have um, experience painting or drawing. Uh, by the way, we also um, usually have a beginner drawing class as well. Um, an example of a, a little bit more advanced class would be uh, an oil class where we go outside on location. In that kind of class, usually, um, the teacher prefers somebody to have at least some drawing experience. I see. So I've also become familiar with you as an artist over the last few years, and I know you as a pretty fabulous colorist, and uh, I know that you brought some work here today. Do you want to talk about your influences and maybe show some of your work? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is a painting that I did recently in Bristol of the Stone Barn um, at Cold State Park. People may be familiar with that. And um, so I also wanted to mention that we have 
um, every Sunday afternoon during the summer, we meet at different locations. It's drop-in for everyone, anyone who would like to join us to paint or draw or in any media. Um, and I, this is an example of a painting I did during one of our Sunday afternoon um, drop-in sessions. So plein air means? Uh... Plein air is the French term. It literally means full air. But basically what it means is that you're uh, painting outside rather than in a studio. You're going on location. Going on location. So we yes. were talking earlier about how I always thought of you having an impressionist kind of vent. And I noticed that, for instance, in this painting you're using blue in the shadows. And one of the things I learned about the impressionist is that you never use black to, to define things. But we went on to talk about it a little bit, and one of your favorite artists is Child Hassam. Uh, and I remember seeing some of his work when we made a trip to Connecticut. Um, anybody else that you have uh, an affinity towards? Well, another another artist um, that I that I like a lot is Edward Hopper. Uh, one of the re he's not an impressionist, but. One of the reasons I like him is the way he paints buildings because I, I like to paint buildings as well rather than uh, simply painting landscapes. Um, I, I love looking at his uh, paintings of, of uh, lighthouses. And also I noticed in Portsmouth itself there's a lot of hopperesque type homes with the mansard roofs that he used to enjoy yeah. uh, painting. Um, you have another piece that you said that you painted that uh, Common Fence Point. Uh, this is an, another plein air piece. Um, we're actually kind of developing a relationship with their burgeoning arts, arts program there. And this is a house, uh, I think, on the river uh, you, were, you were talking about? Uh, yes, I did. I actually, this is almost still wet. I painted this a few days ago on Sunday also as part of our um, plein air um, open, open workshops. And um, you're right, this is a cottage that caught my eye, um, located at Common Fence Point. Um, I believe it's actually looking out uh, towards uh, Tiverton on the other side of the, the river. Now when you do these plein air events, are there artists there that kind of step in and help out or give suggestions or do people pretty much go out on their own? Oh, um, that's a, a good question. you do a critique at the end? Uh, yes, we, at the end we have an, an optional, um, we share what we did that day and normally people um, ask for comments. It's, it's very um, low key. Low key and comfortable. Yes. So there's, uh -huh. there's no pressure. You kind of go out there and enjoy the sun and the weather and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and just kind of paint what's there. Now I also know that you said earlier that you were a very experienced teacher and you teach uh, or you taught English as a second language. I also know that you've done some trips to uh, Mexico and Cuba in the past couple of years and I n noticed that some of your artwork, especially your printmaking, has reflected that influence. So I was wondering if you wanted to show us something related to that. Sure. Um, actually, actually um, my husband is, is from Mexico originally, and um, so we have a home uh, down there about two hours north of Mexico City in a, in a small town. And I love to go down there and paint or draw because I don't have a lot of other things to do like I do here. So it gives me a lot of opportunity to do that. Um, this is actually a photo from a photograph I took um, in Mexico City of um, somebody who was um, playing music, uh, you know, for money out on the street. Um, and then I, I turned it into um, a woodblock print. If you're familiar with the process, you you uh, carve into a block, and then ink it, and you and you produce a print. Yeah. Uh, now, did you use an actual wood block, or would that be a linoleum? I actually use linoleum. Yeah. Uh, but the process is, is the same. Right, but mm -hmm. it's uh, 
there's a different feel to it and it's less unpredictable because if you use actual wood you have the chance that it might splinter as you dig into it but that's Lin true Linole and also wood usually wood is nice too because you could see the wood grain yes many absolutely times. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is this is um, this is from a drawing we went to um, these are our Mayan girls uh, we went to um, a, a, a Mayan uh, religious festival and these two girls were standing in front of me and I, I drew them from the back and um, I just sort of I just liked the way that the design came out uh, so I decided to make a print of the two girls as well yes uh, now I know that you're You've taught classes in printmaking. You once or twice taught a class on making fish prints, which I thought was pretty unique, um, where you took a, a frozen fish and you, and you basically inked it up and made an impression. Um, I think you said that you're going to be teaching a printmaking class in the near future. Uh, yes, a uh, three-week class starting uh, Tuesday is the end of October. And uh, for that class, we will be doing, it's called Printmaking Without a Press. We will be doing some linoleum cuts for that class. Um, and also some um, hand, hand, we'll be hand cutting some stencils, um, which is also considered a printmaking process. They used to use that, it's called pochoir and in French, but before they had lithography, they would actually cut stencils and um, make prints using their stencils. It's different than the kind of stenciling you think of um, decorating a home or decorating walls. Now, you also did uh, some monoprints. I know that you had uh, shown during the Still Life Without Fruit or Flowers show, mm -hmm. you did um, some prints of uh, fruit actually and can you talk a little bit about the process of making a monoprint? Sure, um, normally when, when I make a monoprint um, I might take a painting that I've done and maybe I wasn't completely happy with the painting but I liked parts of it so uh, to make a monoprint um, I, I put a piece of plexiglass on top of my painting and either use watercolors or water-soluble crayons to, to draw on the plexiglass. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just have a piece of damp paper which I put over the plexiglass and rub it and it comes off on the paper as a monoprint. It's called a monoprint because normally you can only make one sometimes two there's a shadow but uh, normally just one yeah so and that's a very uh, easy easy process to do for people because uh, they can use some uh, image that they already have even a photograph so uh, sometimes we have workshops in that as well and it's kind of um how would you describe it maybe a poor man's printmaking process because you don't need a lot of equipment you don't need a press all you need is a piece of plexiglass and and some sort of impression. Um, and I know that you can get lots of different effects. In fact, I think you've made some greeting cards using that effect as well. Um, I, I've, I really haven't used it too much for greeting cards, um, only because you can only make one. So if I'm making greeting cards, I, I prefer to use another process where I can actually make a number of greeting cards. Oh, I yeah. got you. Mm -hmm. So it, I think that I saw some some cards that you made and they seem to have a similar theme to the mono prints I saw you do of the strawberries for instance. How would you have done those? Uh, the ones that you might have seen recently at the guilds um, of cakes um, yes, the cakes. Those were actually stencils. So, oh, so, so you made a series of stencils. Uh, yeah, so I just so I made one stencil, you know, cut one stencil out of um, heavy plastic paper, and then once you have your stencil, um, you can simply, you know, pounce. It's called pouncing, yep. and make a number of, of copies. 
So if we were possibly near some sort of holiday season, that would be a good thing for people to learn how to do. Yes, yeah, so actually the, um, the workshop that's coming up, uh, one of the options would be for people to make cards if they, if they would like, and the oh, nice. processes that we will learn would lend themselves to making cards. All right, mm -hmm. so I think we're getting close to the end of our time. I wanted to really thank you. I appreciate you showing up today. Thank you very much, enjoyed it. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, today we have uh, artist, singer, songwriter, Sue DeSalt Eddins. Uh, Sue got involved with the Portsmouth Arts Guild a couple years ago, and I think she was introduced to uh, the Guild through uh, the recommendation of Paula DeSano. Is that right? Yes. And. Um, you're, we were just talking before the segment started, and you're quite multi-talented. I know you just told me a story about uh, a recommendation you got in high school, but you've gone on to become a pretty accomplished painter, and I know you're in a couple of bands. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your art experience? Um, well, I've always I've always liked drawing and painting, and it's it's always been like a release to me. Even when I was younger, I I'm a fidget, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I will draw. If in, even if I'm in a a meeting at work or something, I would draw and sketch on the sides of the notes I was taking, and uh, it's. It's just been something that's always been part of me. I feel like, I feel like it's a, it's an extension of my mind. <laughs> well, you, you know, at the Guild, we we kind of promote all the art, so it's always a pleasure to have someone who's not only a, a painter but also a musician. And I know that you and I kind of share a similar background in that you're into or were into comic books. You just we're talking about a uh, a mural you painted at a now defunct comic book store. Yeah. This would kind of give you a, a give us a good lead into as to where your art heads. <laughs> you want to <laughs> tell us about that mural? Uh, yeah, I was talking with the comic book store owner, and we just and he he wanted something that was going to kind of shake things up. So I painted uh, the character Lobo, who's a uh, bounty hunter with uh, a DC comic bounty hunter. He's not not a nice guy. He also and, travels <laughs> in outer space. Right. Yes. But I painted him dressed <clears throat> as Santa Claus, so I made a Lobo Lobo Claus, and in his bag instead of toys, it was body parts of X Men. Okay. That he had <laughs> dismembered. <laughs> All right, and uh, I know that you also did murals at uh, a movie theater, and yes. Was there some kind of controversy involved with that at one point? Um, well, the, I worked at the theater, mm -hmm. and I uh, there was a painter that used to come in and do murals, and then she stopped. And I, I was scared to death of heights, but those windows are huge. And uh, I said, I, re I really want to paint these, so I'm just going to conquer it. And the first one I did was for a movie that had the Empire State Building in oh, it. Oh, nice. And at the top of the window, if you looked at the spire, it was kind of wonky because I was <laughs> shaking so bad from being up on that high ladder. But I, I did that for several years. Very cool. So now I think we can start uh, showing some of your artwork. And then uh, after that, we'll talk a little bit about the music you do. So if you want to show us the first piece and tell us a little story. You, you just said that this, you called this your breakout painting, that this was something that was very personal and it started you on this path that you're on now with your, with your work. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I was uh, caring for my mom after my dad passed and it was very trying. Uh, if, if you haven't ever taken care of an elderly person, it's, it's tough. And um, I've that emotion gets pent up in you. There's, there's a side of compassion. There's also a side of, 
frustration and so forth. And I do get that out in my music and in my lyrics, but it wasn't enough. And I, I said, I need to paint again. And I grabbed a canvas that I had, and this was the first thing that just came out. And I call it uh, Scream. So we're seeing kind of a reflection of the old Edvard Munch painting, but also I'm seeing that not only is it uh, full of despair and, and kind of cold, but it's also really warm and intimate at the same time. So it, it uh, is really strong and evocative. Um, so what would the next one be that you would like to share with us today? Um, the next one is... <coughs> is an abstract that uh, I call Synapse. And um, it's just uh, kind of a representative of uh, that brain activity, those ideas that pop into your head that uh, may have semblance or not have semblance. And well, there might be some perseverating thoughts, some thoughts that uh are very prominent that uh, kind of keep you awake at night kind of feeling. That's what I'm getting out of it. <laughs> and you also, again, you're, you're playing with uh, the almost crystalline shapes and, and then there's some sort of creature, some kind of thought maybe or parasite and you have all of the connections. Uh, to me, um, the idea of the brain is reflected in, in how trees grow because they just, the parts of the brain, and I'm talking about the literal parts and how your brain grows, it just goes on and on and on. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong piece. I, I like to do work that can be personal to the person that's viewing it. Yes. And they can, uh, you know, everybody has their own, their own, own interpretation. I'm not sure if I would call it abstract because I'm seeing lots of recognizable things, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you want to continue with the artwork or do you want to talk about the bands that you're in at the moment? Um, sure, we'll continue with the artwork and okay. then we'll talk right. about the bands. Um, I, I do mainly portrait type work. This is, uh, so I do some of the movie art and also uh, art from uh, the rock stars and things like that that are recognizable. This is uh, the Captain Picard Borg. Yes. And that, uh, which was difficult for me because I'm not used to doing like a biomechanical type thing or, or uh, any kind of a mechanical thing, machinery. So it was a challenge. Well, I, you know, you were talking about uh, your, your background in auto mechanics. So <laughs> you get to play with that a little bit. And then, of course, uh, it's a kind of a science fiction-y theme, obviously. Uh, I know that some of the other portraits I've seen you do were movie themed. I remember seeing a Betty Davis from yeah. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I uh, did a pretty fabulous Bela Lugosi as Dracula, um, and then I think you there was a painting of Ron Perlman yes. that had uh, a really neat color sense to it. Uh, there was lots of almost a rainbow effect happening with the light, um, and I I do like to play with. I actually brought one that I do like to play with portraits and do them something a little different. This one's Ray Charles that I uh, kind of gave him a stained glass effect. Which is, it's, it's, to me it's almost like synesthesia. That's when you, you interpret one sense with another because even though this is a visual, you can almost hear the sound because of how the color works with it. You have that kind of a it, it is a glass effect in the background, and uh, obviously there's the reference uh, with stained glass to churches, and obviously um, he was a gospel singer as well. Yes. 
and you were you were telling us a great story about Mahalia Jackson and how she how it was recommended that she not pursue the career that she, she did. <laughs> Which is unreal because she was the best. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and uh, that's a that's a fabulous piece. Thank you. And I and I think that you said that you were starting to work with uh, a new medium. Um, you have an oil painting that you I just do. completed. I do. I this is my first ever oil painting. I. Uh, I, I figured if I was going to go into oils, I should literally dive in. So okay. I went with an underwater scene. And uh, I'm actually working on two more underwater scenes because I'm trying to work on that one effect to see if I can really get good at it right now before I move on. But I, I'm enjoying the medium. It's very different, and it's a test of patience. Now, how, why would you call it a test of patience? Um, the acrylics dry quickly. I, exactly. I paint quickly. I think quickly. And with the oil, I have to do it layers. I, I have to wait for it to dry. I have no choice. Right. And uh, that's the patience. Now, you know that that's... they do make water-based oils. Oh, don't tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, they, if the effects are the same. The beauty of oils is the fact that you can layer them and you can put down a color and then put down uh, a wash over it or um, add another layer of solid color uh, and and the fact that light comes in and then refracts on its way out gives you that shimmering effect that is not easily acquirable with acrylics um, because again the fact that they dry so fast uh, I think it you if you wanted to you could play with media with acrylic you could actually mix um, matte or gloss media and and get that effect but if you see it as a test of patience I, I think that you're you you can definitely go in a lot of different directions with the oils as well now let's talk about music okay <clears throat> oh, um you had mentioned i'm in two bands uh -huh. um music's just it's it's always been a part of my life I was in a, a band in high school. We, we had a little band together. That's where I discovered I cannot play, play bass and sing at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. I played bass for about a hot minute, and then that was it. I know bass players <laughs> that can't even play bass. They, they keep changing the time. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. So I, played, I, <clears throat> I did play some acoustic guitar and uh, wrote some songs with a friend of mine, and, and we used to sing, but I put most of the music really on hold through throughout uh, uh, my marriage raising my kids and such and um, now the kids are up and out I answered an ad I saw for a metal singer and songwriter and I've never done metal before but I sent him a clip of my singing and said if you think you can work with me let's see what we can do and now five five years later we're still together, Chained to Insanity. And so that's what the name of the band was when you started out? We had no name. Oh, okay. uh, D Dave uh, Lazareshi and myself just got together, and we spent about a year writing songs. And uh, now we've got almost 60 songs we've written. Some are some are, are appropriate for our band, and some of them are not. They're just, just not the right genre for it, but mm -hmm. we still write them and, and uh, record our little demos and and have fun with it. He writes the music and he'll usually typically give me a CD or something of something he's written and then I wrap lyrics to it. Very good. Well, I think that we've kind of reached the end of our time today. I want to really thank you for coming by and, and sharing all of this with us. Well, thank you for having me. Okay. It's a pleasure. That wraps it up for another episode of Art Matters with Wayne Quackenbush. <laughs>